Bona tarda a tothom. Welcome to Startup Prime. Um, who is the first time coming to Startup Prime Andorra? We did an event back in May with the, with the minister. So one, two, three, four, five. All right, we have a pretty decent uh, amount of newcomers. Welcome to Startup Prime. Uh, so we are the largest entrepreneurs community worldwide. We are present in more than 400 cities in over 125 different countries, including beautiful places like Andorra. This is our second event. The first event was in May. We had. Uh, the honor of interviewing Minister Gilbert Savoya. And what we do is promote entrepreneurship worldwide. We interview founders of companies, we interview relevant people in the, in the tech industry, or nowadays it's much more I don't know, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and all the trends in the industry. And what we do is have this fireside format, fireside chat format, in which we interview people just to uh, have them tell the stories that actually it's possible to be an entrepreneur, it's good to be an entrepreneur, but it's also hard, right? We want to hear the founder stories and we want to know what they're working on and, if possible, share that knowledge with, uh, with us, right? First of all, I want to I wanna give a quick shout out to all of our sponsors because this event is not possible without the three amazing sponsors we've got. So please, I would like to request a very big applause for Valbank, a new Andorra Telecom and Actua. Please give it up for them. Our plan is to make a series of events per year here in Andorra, right? Uh, we start with the minister, then our plan is to bring international speakers that probably wouldn't come here otherwise, or maybe in the context of bigger events, but we want to make this a regular thing because in the context of Startup Grind, we're such a large network that it's good for you. If you need any help in other cities where we are there, we can, we can bridge you, we can connect you to the cities, right? So if you, if you have a business that wants to connect or expand to Germany, for instance, we can be that connection, right? We can provide that connection. And likewise, the other way around, it also works, right? Companies that might want to expand to Andorra, they know they have friendly faces and people like us that will open the doors and we'll introduce them to our partners, to our sponsors, to the to government or to the communities that are relevant to their business. Well, without further ado, I'm going to present our speaker for tonight. And we're really blessed to have at the Nizam stage because she's a really good friend of ours. She comes all the way from Gibraltar, and that's not an easy travel, right? Because uh, she had to fly to Barcelona, and also from that very, very, um, let's say, peculiar airport they've got in, in Gibraltar. And we want to talk about the advantages or, of operating in small jurisdictions, right? Especially in the fields of fintech and, um, and blockchain, which is something that's really trending in both jurisdictions right now. And also, because it's startup, Brian, talk about the founder career. So, Denise Matthews is the founder and CEO of Omi uh, Media, a company that creates brand awareness through events and activities for, uh, for companies. Then she's also operations manager at GSX Blockchain Innovation Center in Gibraltar. She also works for, what's, uh, so the... Sorry. Sorry. Concilium. Uh, Group. Concilium Group. So first of all, I just want to say yeah. thank you to Ferran and Alex for inviting me. And Dora is beautiful. And uh, thank you all for coming. So, okay, Gibraltar and the Blockchain Innovation Center um, at the moment are emerging a little bit in terms of um, activ new activity there. Uh, that has attracted uh, international companies to, mm -hmm. to look into you know basing themselves there and one of those companies is called Concilium Group. At the moment they're based in London. They're Venture Capital and Blockchain Accelerator Group um, and they're relocating to Gibraltar so they're using me to help them do that. One of the things that I really wanted to cover here is first of all can we, can we start with your career so how did you start and what got you into that field of activity? With well, I mean I've always been a people person. I enjoyed um, building my own uh, brands and, and business. So PR, uh, media, communication was, was always my strength. So in terms of being an entrepreneur, I also have uh, an insatiable desire to, to work and to make things happen. So I decided to work for myself. The first business I ran, I, I started when I was 22. So I had a company called DM Promotions for about five years in Gibraltar, and then I wanted to move to Spain and expand, and I set up a company in Spain at the age of 25 called Profile Advertising, and I worked there for 15 years. But recently, for personal and 
actually, you know, um, family reasons, I decided Gibraltar was a place to come back home to. So I moved back there three years ago. And how did you start getting involved with the community? One of the things I'm learning about Andorra from my visits here and from visiting also uh, beautiful and small places like Gibraltar is that it's quite easy to get involved with the community because yeah. everybody knows each other, right? So can you tell a little bit the advantages and the disadvantages that you have found of operating in smaller communities? Well, the advantages, obviously, you have access to people, you have access to um, government offices quite easily uh, in small jurisdictions. So you can ask to see people in, in quite high uh, government positions and, and they will speak to you. It's not the same when you come from big cities to begin with. Um, you tell me. Yeah. So the other thing is that it's also very easy to make yourself known in a small community, especially if you're local. So that's always an advantage. The disadvantages, I would say, is that it's competition can emerge very quickly. Because if people see that what you're doing and that you're doing it well and it seems to be successful, you'll get another three or four companies trying to do the same as, as you are. And also you have a limited target audience. So in terms of having events and, and trying to attract, you have to keep reinventing what you're doing. Otherwise, you can't keep tapping into the same people again and again. How about the thing about where obviously everybody knows each other, is that right? That could be a good thing because there's always a, a way to get probably the minister to be interviewed at Star Prime. Yeah. But on the other way around, if you screw up, everybody sees it, right? Yeah. Have you had any experience in this? Well, you want to share any? Yeah, or? of course. I mean, you, you learn from your biggest mistakes and that's something that's always going to be part of the process. So I uh, decided to quickly set up uh, one media and events in Gibraltar when I'd been there. I'd been back there 11 months. Uh, and I'd been very lucky to meet somebody called Mike Balfour, who said to me, you know, I want, to, I want you to come and work for me. And it turns out he was the founder of Fitness First. All right. Fitness First in 1990s was the biggest chain of gyms in the world. And he created this business from the age of 43 onwards. So he um, hired me. I worked for him for 11 months. And then I just said, you know what, Mike, I need to go and do my own thing. And he said, you know, just go for it. Um, so you, your question was, remind me again, because now I'm telling the story Yeah, if you screw up ah, in such so, a small community that everybody has access to everything, and yeah. you might end up in the newspapers, right? Yeah. So basically... So how, how can you bounce back from that? Basically, one of the first events that I had to do was a very big event, and I made the mistake of rushing into it and not getting things in writing. It, it backfired big time on me, but luckily... So no contracts, things like that? Things, things like, like that, yeah. yeah. Like you know, they, they also came in with huge demands, and because I wanted to prove myself at the time that I could do this, um, I made some you know, big mistakes. And when they left Gibraltar, they left some debt with them too. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, because of one of the sponsors was, was the group that now hires me, uh, they backed me up and I was able to, to get out of that situation quite, not without a fight, but it got resolved in the end. So, but it was, it was a big, big deal for me at the time uh, because it was a reputational risk, as you say, in such a small place. It is the case that also small jurisdictions seem to be very protective of what they have. So how welcoming were they in your case where you had quit the Gibraltar for some years and you came back? How welcoming were they? Did you find any sort of resistance of you getting back to your... I don't think they really... I didn't give them yeah. a choice. All right. <laughs> I just saw there was a gap. There was a gap in the, in the corporate community in terms of, of what could be done. There was a gap in, in how much uh, people wanted to do um, some more networking and find out more of the new um, activities that were going on. And I created a platform to be able to do that. Um, so whether people wanted to welcome me or not, they were just interested and curious. And then I guess that maybe they liked me. So maybe you're, you're known as the events and community person in, in Gibraltar, because one of the things maybe you're not aware of this, but she runs Startup Brand Chapter in Gibraltar. Yes, I do. She joined one year and a half ago. She has a very strong and solid chapter. Maybe yeah. you want to tell us how did that help your business? 
because maybe that's a symbiotic relationship we've got, right? Sure. So after the deciding to run a business, I I didn't really have any capital to invest, mm -hmm. um, but I was determined. So I started to look around and think, what is out there that I can use to communicate what I do um, through a bigger brand that will catch everyone's attention? So I needed to build my brand through showing people something, my skill. Um, so I decided to go online and I started following um, different communities. One of them was Startup Grind, the other was uh, Virgin Startup, mm -hmm. because I considered myself a startup too. So they followed me back and I became a little more intrigued and then I decided to just apply online. And the application process went through. And I remember in the interview when um, one of our colleagues was asking me, do you know that this city needs to run a monthly event with at least you know 30 to 50 people where are you going to get them from because <laughs> you're 30k in half yeah, there's 30,000 people yeah. population so yeah it's a, it's a challenge but it worked it worked i mean uh, people started to to really pay attention and only 2 months after they decided to announce uh, that distributed ledger technology was going to be um, regulated as part of the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission. Mm -hmm. And this first announcement came with a, a digital conference and they needed people to get to know about this conference. So the government said, you know, you, you're building a network and a community in, in startup and tech. Can you help us? So I said, yes. Um, and immediately after that, they they uh, started to sponsor the event series. I think we're having some problems with yes. the, <laughs> with <laughs> the video, not with the mic. We can we can solve this. All right, uh, let's continue, anyways. So I was uh, I was going to go. So how did that relationship with the with did that uh, pay off? Actually, I think you might have changed this. It's yours. All right. Yeah. I think. All right, yeah, you can keep it here. So what I w was going to ask is, um, did you ev eventually find the community that you were looking after? How did that help you, not only in your business, but also how much of an impact did you create in Gibraltar by emerging as sort of a leader in the events industry, in the community industry in Gibraltar? Um, I think that because of the fact that there is not really a platform where people could come and introduce themselves to the community and also for companies to come and learn about all the new activities or or just simply talk to each other um, it's become something of a of a unmissable type of of meeting so um, in terms of how it helps my business and how it helps other businesses well I've been able to to get jobs like an, being an operations manager for GSX Group. Yep. Um, I've also you know, become business development for Concilium Group. This wouldn't have happened without me being in the roles that I've, that I've already created for myself. But I remember the first event I did, I actually had to pay for it myself because I didn't find any sponsorship. Um, and after that event, when I was feeling unsure as you do, you doubt whether you're on the right track even though you think you are. Uh, somebody bumped into me in the street and they said, you know what, I went to your first event and I just launched a marketing business and I met my first client at your event. So one of my sponsors hired a, a young um, budding entrepreneur to, be, to do their marketing and he still does it today. So I think the impact is, is important. I mean, small communities, if, if you don't create these type of platforms, sometimes people don't have another way to, to access without funding, without investment, without you know, scale. They don't have access to be able to, to pitch themselves one-on-one -on -one as they do in this sort of casual uh, networking environment. Because one of the things we do at, at, at Starbrains try to create regular events so that, because an event that happens once a year, it's a conference, it's an event, right? But an event that happens every month in big cities, every two, three months in probably smaller cities and towns, and, and even in the universities we're doing it now, it creates community. 
you go to the event, you know who you're going to find there, you know what the format is like, you know what can you expect of the event, right? But at the same time, it also allows you to prepare for the next edition, right? So I know I'm going to meet this person there, so I can schedule my whole set of, you know, meetings and, and all that, or even the, the, the speakers that we've got. Do you find that you've been able to have people on stage that you have interviewed that they, they could meet people from the audience they couldn't have met otherwise? Absolutely. I've had people on stage who then have hired people yeah. they've met at the events in terms of in internal staff. Uh, so they've come to the events as a speaker and they've ended up meeting people who, who eventually work for them in their businesses. Um, another of the things that's really important that's uh, when you're at the startup early stage, sometimes, or a lot of the time, you exchange skill sets. So I, as a events management or business development, might need somebody to develop something else in my business who's a startup. And so we exchange, rather than money, at that ver very early stage, uh, we exchange skills. And that can only happen in a forum where you put all these types of people together. Or you might come across somebody who says, you know what, I like what you do. I'm going to put some money into, into what you do and, and sort of seed your, your business. And it does happen because I've firsthand experienced it in, in our chapter in Gibraltar. One of the things that's really cool is that we always get to see what the future is going to look like, right? Because we get all these speakers, all these up and coming startups, all these investors investing in things because if you're an investor, I talk to you then we have a conversation and you'll tell me, oh, you know what, I'm investing in this and that. Mm -hmm. And in a year from now, that will be the huge trend, right? So in a sense, we're privileged. Have you experienced that also in Gibraltar and also with the technologies that we were going to cover, uh, cover a little bit later on? Did what? you see blockchain coming like two years ago when you were creating events for people? Or I honestly had never even heard the word blockchain. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> in fact, you would say DLC to me and I would say, what? Yeah. So... Um, I think that the fact that I'm interviewing people, aside from being exposed to this, also helps learn about, as you say, emerging industries that otherwise you wouldn't. And even in, in the, the, the bigger picture is that we have channels now, we're talking to each other in terms of the Startup Grind network in other countries. And what is trending maybe in Gibraltar is not necessarily going to trend everywhere, although with blockchain it seems to be the case. But I get exposed to, to other things that are happening elsewhere. Um, things like the remote work model, which is a very interesting model for Gibraltar also, mm -hmm. because of our lack of space. Um, something that, because it's a more traditional corporate structure there, and there's a reluctance to introduce this more remote model. Can we go a little bit deeper into that? So yes. why there is not enough you know, demand for or space for all the workers? Is it because of the only of the lack of space that yeah, you physically have? Yeah, physically there's a lack of space. Yeah. And obviously it's very expensive um, because of yeah. the lack of space. So there's there's not enough. We, we wouldn't, even when you're talking about larger events, I think the maximum you could hold there in a, the biggest venue is 250 people. Oh, so, wow, yeah. so we're very um, restricted in terms of what we can do yeah. um, and how many people we can have there. On the other... The other part of that is... I mean, it's like a 2% of the population, which is good, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of how, what I've believed always yeah. being a local is that without an industry, without agriculture, without resources, the only space we really have to explore is the digital one. Great. So, so that's why I think, you know, remote model, business models are, are interesting. We work on a on a remote basis with startup grind, but there there are many other examples of, of remote work, and they and they're really good. And one of the things is obviously you're specialising in that probably because of the culture or the kind of companies that are there or the legislation, right? Um, do you think that the cu current legislation in Gibraltar favouring companies like I don't know more like fintech or blockchain or gambling and all of that? came as a result of them spotting like, oh, there's this trend. No one else is giving them any space or it's not allowing the laws and legislation to operate here. Let's do it ourselves because we're small and we can therefore change the laws more rapidly. You think that's the case or, how, or did it happen the other way around? There's various factors and I think one of the 
biggest is that we have so much political pressure yeah. that uh, we need to find ways to, to make it work. So I think it's more or less run like a very agile business. Mm -hmm. So whenever there is something that seems to be um, beneficial uh, in terms of the e-gaming, which they made um, laws for e-gaming about 20 years ago, you know, others have followed. So it, they try to, to pioneer to make sure that Gibraltar has a very up-to-date and dynamic economy. Actually, we covered this with uh, Minister in the previous event, right? So Andorra is pioneering in terms of smart cities and even the concept of smart country, right? You've got Estonia setting up all these electronic residency and you've got other countries and jurisdictions legislating more for ICOs and cryptocurrencies and this and that. So what is Gibraltar just betting on right now, zeroing on? So it was distributed ledger technology to begin with because I feel that the, the government at the time thought, you know, it, it, we just regulate the technology, uh, yeah. then we're playing it safe. But without the funding behind the technology, which is where ICOs, initial coin offerings and tokens come in, it's very difficult to continue to attract the, the companies that are really big players. So initially they just announced DLT regulation, that became law in January. So uh, any company wishing to operate on blockchain can legally operate from Gibraltar. We also have a beneficial tax regime, so there's you know, a little bit of, it sets us apart as well. So um, then came the announcement that there will be a additional ICO and token regulation announced in the not too far future, but you know, this is a process, it's always a process. The GFSC, which is the Financial Services Commission, want to, because they're the first ones to act, they want to be sure that they do it right. It's risky to be the first one, right? Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that really strikes me as surprising is that all these small communities or jurisdictions and small countries, city states, if you will, they don't team up very often, right? Startups team up oftentimes to go against the establishment or even government or the bigger corporations. Mm -hmm. I find surprising that smaller jurisdictions, uh, even you know, being so agile and leaner and all of that, they don't team up very often. Why do you think that is? And how could we bridge communities like Andorra and Gibraltar in the first place? Well, there's always the feeling of, of competitive um environment so yeah, but like sometimes you know Google has now partnered with uh, with Apple to yeah. become the, the default search engine on the iPhone right right so why don't smaller communities do it this cooperation I'm with you yeah. you don't have to convince me yeah, 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 you're you. right. <laughs> so I I get uh, I get the feeling that they protect they feel that, that it's better to protect the jurisdiction by keeping everything more on the internal side yeah. I find personally, that things that are, I've seen just today in Andorra are pretty impressive and we have nothing like that going on in, in Gibraltar. You know, we, we're not a smart city, so we're trying to attract tech and, and innovation companies to set up, but we don't have a smart city infrastructure. Whether that will come in the future, it's not the priority of investment right now. Mm -hmm. They, there's also the the pressure of Brexit coming along, so you know they're moving they're moving this possibly faster than than other other things that that could be or should be done. But uh, in terms of bridging gaps, it's having that conversation, you know, and to have that conversation, there has to be somebody to build the bridge. So I'm sure there is enough of the blockchain happening around the world to go twice round small jurisdictions from what I see. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is no easy answer to that question. I think there just has to be a need. When there is a need, people move. How important do you think that we as leaders of communities, be it Startup Rhine or blockchain groups over the wall or Startup Weekend or this and that, how important are we to tell governments that, hey, there is this happening, 
by collaborating with other communities and other countries, other jurisdictions, we could make bigger things. So how pushy should we be in order to achieve grander collaborations? Well, you know what I found, and, and this goes back to when I introduced Startup Grind, I found that if you try and have a conversation, you don't really get very far. But if you take the action and make something happen, and yeah. then you have the conversation, you tend to have a result based on the action that you've produced. Because if there has been some positive outcome, then they feel more inclined to take the jump. Um, I always think that for any government or government minister, it's always risky to back somebody's idea or, or, or to back somebody's initiative without having some kind of track record because it's all about getting the votes at the end of the day. Everybody wants to win the next election. So mm -hmm. I find you know it's important to, to actually, rather than just say, let's do this, let's do that, go out there, do as much as you can, and then go back to the table and say, look, this is how far I got. Will you help me go further? And usually, usually, um, some things will happen. One of the things that I, I find really surprising about Gibraltar, and in the positive aspect, is it has really understood the power of blockchain. Legislation is being adapted. There's a lot of companies being welcomed and all of that. How detrimental is that to the rest of communities? So people not working on blockchain or e-gaming or the industries that are being favored by the government. So let's say if I want to create a company in VR in a small jurisdiction that has probably not enough resources or people or time or whatever, um, in the industry that's not super favored by the government, government or the institutions. So how detrimental is that? How Just put it on the blockchain. Just put <laughs> it on the blockchain, all right. So Could I, okay, so Gibraltar is not a place where you will get um, excessive support to start a business. Great. It's very entrepreneurial, but more in the traditional sense. So if you, you would have to, look at Gibraltar to see why you want to set up your VR company there first. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say you're going to find excessive amounts of people willing to fund you, even if it's a great company. Great. Um, but you will have maybe a good work-life balance because it's, it's nice and a beneficial tax regime. So if that works for your VR company, then fine. I wouldn't say that they are extremely open to all types of blockchain companies coming. It's the blockchain companies who actually want to operate in a regulated space that are coming to Gibraltar because obviously you can run blockchain business anywhere in the world. So it's those who want to operate as a regulated uh, business that are, are coming there to set up small offices to begin with um, and later on, I guess, maybe you know scale up their operations there but it will never be you know, as a, an extreme center for all of these type of companies that brings me to my next question is mm -hmm. and you told me that you're doing you know you're doing a lot of events you're hosting a lot of events and that if the word blockchain is on the title of the event people will show up more eagerly and after like four or five consecutive events with blockchain people don't get tired Whereas you know you should spice it up with mixing other kinds of, of events, right? But you feel like, hey, this is an endless source of people coming over. So do you think that that's a, you should actually empower these and contribute more by having more and more events until the trend goes out? Or do you also need to contribute to balance the situation a little bit and help other communities? I do think it's important to help all types of communities and so, what I've started to do also is, is to bring two types of guests together. Um, coincidentally, at my, at my last event, for example, I wasn't planning to have another blockchain speaker, but I was talking to the founder of another organization called Girls in Tech, who happens to be the CTO of Playtech Innovation Labs, which is uh, produces games for e-gaming companies. Um, and Last minute, I got a request from the COO of, uh, of a very well-known company called Gnosis. Um, and she's just a prominent female in tech. So she came on, and that attracted a lot of people because they know that this is a new company that's going to set up in Gibraltar. So obviously, people want to come and sniff around. There is a thirst 
and a curiosity in, in all of the industry. But we spoke about women in tech. So if you can always try and... With blockchain. With blockchain. Yeah, definitely. It's got to be there, man. It's got to be there. <laughs> so in terms of, of that, yes, I want to be able to provide all types of opportunities for people to communicate important messages to, to the audience. But right now, the time is um, DLT. <laughs> and how did you come across you know, the Blockchain Innovation Center and how did you get the opportunity to work for them? Because I see that more and more companies are hiring people off the community because that will bring the community to them, right? Yeah. So how did so, that come along? And so GSX Group was initially a Gibraltar stock exchange which they, they'd been running for about five years and we didn't really have many companies who want to go on the stock exchange. So mm -hmm. they um, were doing okay, but Nick Cowan, the CEO, is, he used to be in banking and he's a very charismatic person. So he um, announced just after the, the DLT regulation was coming into place that the GSX was going to branch into the GBX, which is the first Gibraltar blockchain exchange. And he came on Startup Grind to announce that. Great. And it was completely coincidental. I'd ask him to join as a guest as the CEO of the GSX. And then they decided that this was going to happen in the month that he was going to be a guest. So um, we started the relationship back then. And they kind of followed what I do. and. After that, they just carried on growing. They uh, successfully um, managed to raise a round of funding for the GBX in Asia. Mm -hmm. And they launched the Rock Token. And throughout all of this, the, they, they kept you know, having conversations with me. We were involved in a big conference, uh, and, and they used me as, as the organizer. So it just became evident that there was more to do. And as part of the white paper, the GBX has made a commitment to support Gibraltar service providers, to support in, at an educational level with a center of um, information. And this is where they decided I would be the ideal person to help them create a strategy to, to make a blockchain innovation center happen. And it's very early stage at this time. We were about to launch our first workshop, hopefully in November. We've had a couple of introductory events, but the plans are, are, are big. And I think in terms of a support system to help the community understand uh, what this all means for, for them, it's, it's essential. Can you give a couple of specific examples of what you do? How do you help them? As in, are you scouting actively for like, I don't know, deals to invest in or interesting people to have conversations with? Yeah. Or what sorts of operations? Because it sounds like a very broad term. Well, I mean, I, I like? create a lot of the, of the introductions and partnerships. I, I help co-market the activities that we're, we're planning. I research what activities are suitable. Um, and at this stage, that is all that we can do until we have premises, until we start to hire training, um, proper, you know, professional trainers in, in, this, uh, in this new industry, which is difficult because it's so new uh, that we need to really go out there, see what's out there, and, and bring them in gradually. And at the same time, you're doing business development for the Concilium Group, right? Yes. Which is kind of like operating or working for someone from another country. Yeah. So, you know, part of the same country, different. Um, but you're based in Gibraltar, right? And so how does that not conflict with what you're doing at the Blockchain Innovation Center? How do you coordinate all of this? And do you find interesting synergies between yeah. both groups? So Concilium Group, are, they, they work more as an accelerator. So they are bringing startups to Gibraltar to um, incorporate them there uh, because they'll be relocating as a group to Gibraltar in the next year or so. And the interesting thing with that is that there is a huge synergy between how they operate 
and what the Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange and the Blockchain Innovation Center uh, wants to do. So they actually all know each other. So blockchain is already a community in itself. So they all actually know each other and, and all I do is connect the dots for them and when they need something and they need it done quickly and they need to speak to somebody in Gibraltar who they would take maybe a week to access, they just say, you know, we need this thing, we need this person, can you arrange? And within minutes. So in order to put it, put it out more, more clear, so if you guys want to talk to anybody from Gibraltar, just talk to Denise. She's like the open door to the community. And that brings me to, to my next question. You know one of the values that we've got at Startup Run is we always help first, right? Um, this is our second event here. I know that the values haven't settled yet. You, we're still learning, but we'll do more events. And we always try to help other companies, other people, the people who like uh, meeting first. So how can we as a community in Andorra help you or the Gibraltarian community? Well, as far as I can see, in terms of the the innovation of the city... I know you've been like three hours I know, in Andorra, but, but there was yeah. a long ride, <laughs> and I told you everything about the country story and all of that, but... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think in, in terms of the what we don't have in Gibraltar, what the infrastructure doesn't allow us, because we're not a country in itself, mm -hmm. and we still depend on UK, and logistically we also depend on, on Spain, I think there, there's, there's quite a lot that could be discussed. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's from you know powers that are above and, and they need to be open to that. But I do see the, there's opportunities for what, what is not in one place or to learn from each other at least, or what's missing in one, be able to, to sort of compensate in terms of, of the other jurisdiction and build connections in terms of that. And the other way around, so how can you help the Andorran community or the people that are here in the room by saying like, hey, I can provide this, I can help you with that. So besides being, you know, the open door and, and the facilitator to any sort of connection with, the, with Gibraltar, but... Well, at the moment, what I would say is that not everything is going to fit Gibraltar. As you said before, if you, you had a VR company, maybe Gibraltar wouldn't be the place, but yeah. if we knew that there is a better infrastructure with things that we cannot provide, would be good to be able to say, look, Andorra can provide you with, with an ideal setting for the kind of business you want to run. So, yeah, I believe there is, there is enough uh, to go around and, and not really anything to worry about in terms of trying to protect uh, the business that's coming our way. That's perfect. There's like five minutes left, and I wanted to go into some really quick questions with short answers sure. to see if we can cover this a little bit more to wrap up with your career, right? So uh, things like, what's the most expensive mistake you've ever done in business? Not many, because I never had any money to put into my business. <laughs> but that's a good answer. What was the, so if you were to start again when you were 18 or whenever you started uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, would you do it again, knowing that it's a hard, long, and winding road? I've done it three times. I think I will do it again for the rest of my life. Because the fourth is a charm, right? No, it's the third. Yeah, I know. It's I this know. one. <laughs> this one's going to go big. The next question is being, uh, what's the best thing you've bought for under 100 euros? Or pounds, sorry, because you're in Gibraltar. I, I, the most I, useful thing. Okay. That's it's, a stupid question, I know. It's got to be a bag of shoes. <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a lame answer, but it's the truth. <laughs> no worries. Um, do you find that the Brexit is an opportunity for Gibraltar, or is it not? I don't think it's, it's going to be easy to predict mm -hmm. whether it is or not. I think what it, it has is accelerated uh, movement, and if that's a good thing, maybe. Uh, accelerated movement can also create mistakes, but... What can we do? It's not our choice. We voted 99% to stay in the European Union. Wow, so. that's... So we, we just can't, can't have a say. As long as we, we feel like there is, there is support coming from UK in terms of getting a fair deal, then... But it's not our choice. How about the companies you create seem to be like you alone, if I'm not mistaken? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the right choice? Or, and why don't you have partners, founding partners in your companies? I want to, All and right. I think probably that's the biggest mistake. I always feel like if I want something done, I just go and do it myself. 
And I think I need to change that sort of modus operandi and start to trust other people, even if they do it d differently. Um, that's one of the things that you know is going to happen quite soon. Uh, I I believe that if you want to scale, you have to sort of bring that new new people in. Um, one thing that you really believe and people don't like, like a hard truth, you're really convinced about. Mm. Well, if people don't like it, they haven't told me. So yeah, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, it's. I don't know. Gibraltar has to stay British. <laughs> if yeah. you say that in Spain, nobody will like it. But yeah, yeah no, not really anything that comes to mind. All right. So the last question being, uh, I think I didn't, I didn't build up enough courage to ask this the minister, but everybody has got a useless superpower. Something you do exceptionally well, but it's freaking useless. Well, in lack of a better word. But. I used to, I used to be, used to be. I used to sing really well, but I never had the courage to do it in front of people. So there you go. Thank you very I much. I wouldn't say it's a superpower. No, I wouldn't say it's a superpower, but you're scared of singing. All right, please, big applause for Denise. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like, like to open up if there's any questions. I know in the last event they told me, like, don't, don't do this. No one's going to ask questions. And there were a bunch of questions. So if anybody's not shy enough to, to ask a question, We've got a lucky man over there. Thank you for breaking the ice. We didn't pay him to do this. Thank you, thank you Denise. Well, Say your name. Well, uh, my my name is Alex Arbengol. Yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm in charge of, of the Commission for um, Blockchain, yeah, the Andorran Blockchain uh, Association, which is involved with uh, the, 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 the union of, of companies in Andorra. And well, first of all, and in order to, to take the, the, the hand of, of Alex, uh, let's try to, to do this philosophy of help. No? So first of all, uh, thank you very much for being a pioneer on, on bridging the gap no? between, between uh, Gibraltar and Andorra. Thank you very much. No? And I just have just two questions. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you how, how uh, if we're talking about blockchain, we, we're disrupting uh, many many industries which which were which uh, have now they 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 threats and how do you manage with uh, as as the as the new technology uh, head i would say how do you manage with the, the establishment the, the or the classical economy in gibraltar i mean so uh, we could say the the, the banks for example no okay, yeah. how how uh, how, how is your relation? How is it going? No? Well, there, we've been able to provide the the banking, which is always an issue, uh, because we have a private bank in Gibraltar who were um, successfully opening accounts for companies launching ICOs. Uh, it's not easy, and I think they they had some issues. Uh, the other traditional companies were struggling anyway. That's the truth. They, there was a time when there was not a lot of movement in terms of any of our big industries. That's insurance, finance, all of that industry was suffering for quite a while now. So what is happening at the moment is that these new companies are raising funds and that has helped move other things that were kind of dead uh, or very little movement. So they've had to adapt and, and they're trying to adapt, which is why you know this kind of exercise is, is a practical and useful and much needed one. But uh, there will always be challenges. Because it's small, there are lots of people trying to overcome these challenges and the more people who, who work together to do that, the more successful they will be. But uh, but yeah, you're right. There is there is all of the traditional um, sort of pushing back. I don't know. Okay, is, good question. If it answers. Is that another one? Yeah. Perfect. The second question is about um, the Big Brother London. No, as I understood, perhaps uh, they, they, it's a big uh, fund uh, uh, sender to to Gibraltar, mm -hmm. and you use it uh, to to canalize it to to the startups. No. Uh, my question goes: uh, How 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 do you what do you think uh, it's uh, it's more nice for London 
uh, investors uh, of Gibraltar, it's the, reg the regulation or the fast regulation you're having or the low, low taxes somehow? I, I think, to be honest, the, the tax regime helps, but it's not the, the factor that really pushes people to relocate a business. Um, right now, what pushes people to re relocate is the fact that there is a regulatory environment and they want to appear to their advisors and investors, especially if they're a group or, or they're a startup that, that has raised quite a bit of funding successfully as a serious um, and functional business. So that is what pushes people to come and, and set up a, a business there. I think essentially that's, that's what is moving people. Thank you. So now my gift. In Andorra we have written on the flag, Virtus Unita Fortier, which means together strength is better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. I guess there was another question over there. Yeah. Thank you. Say your name. Hi there. My name is Camila. Hello. How are you doing? Um, my question will be a little bit different. Like how, because you mentioned something about moving the female uh, community in the smaller community. Mm -hmm. Because I, I used to live in Barcelona and it was like, well, we were able to meet and like giving uh, advices for like very, very business focus. But what is your experience to move in the small community? How you started or if, if it's successful or it's like what kind of obstacles you have to move the female entrepreneurs? Confidence. Confidence because everybody knows each other. So it's difficult to have women put themselves out there in situations where they may be criticized or they might make a, make a mistake. So there is a lot of pressure to, to make sure that you, you do what you do um, behind the scenes. But I think that um, more and more importantly is the fact that there, there is things that women have to bring to the table that have a different perspective. And simply that is important enough to give them a platform to have their say. Good question. Thank you. There's another one. No? It's a good question. I think it's good enough. Well, we can wrap it up with a big applause for everybody, not only for Denise, but Thank also you. for you. Um,